Today, I'm kind of continuing off what Kara started to discuss. I'm going to talk about combined <coughs> bending and axial forces on masonry columns. So, probably most of us remember from concrete, we had our favorite strength interaction diagram where you write up nine points, you plot the diagram, and that gives you a visual representation of what axial loads and bending load you can have. We're basically, I'm going to just walk through the process of doing that for a masonry column. So, this presentation is going to be pretty equation heavy. It's not going to be super exciting. I'm pretty much just taking something out of the textbook and trying to explain it and make this an easy step-by-step -step reference for if you're trying to do a strength interaction diagram for masonry. So, the nice thing is there's only four points. So it's not nearly as bad as concrete. But we're going to just dive right in. I don't know. I thought there was another slide there. I'll briefly explain what these four points are. If you'll notice here on the right, this shows all of them there, and we'll come back to this diagram repeatedly. But the first one has the entire masonry section in compression, and then we'll move into some points as the neutral axis moves across your section and parts of the column go in tension. So, first point we're going to examine, um, our, mas our entire masonry section is in some amount of compression. Now, there is a minimum eccentricity that you have to put on every column you design, so it's not an even, you'll notice this trap is already at the bottom right, it's not an even distribution, but all the masonry is in compression, which means compression controls. Um, I think Kara already showed this equation, but the load eccentricity is defined as the moment over the moment over the axial load, and you're required to put 0.1 times the thickness is your absolute minimum eccentricity, but if you have any moment, it'll probably be greater than that. And then one important term, term we need to know is the kern distance. And that's basically where the stress on the left side of your cross section goes to zero. And the masonry there isn't in compression or tension, it just has no stress. So for a normal rectangle, your kern distance is t over 6. Um, and our first case here is when, if you'll see at the top, our eccentricity is less than that kern distance. So for that, um, once you know you're in this region and we're plotting out this region, you can find the masonry stress using this equation, P over A plus M over S. To use this region of design, you need to be within a, the first third of your masonry stress. So once you, this, once you have more than a third of your masonry stress, you're not allowed to use this region. You have to, um, that's too much axial. It has to do again with minimums and making sure that it won't buckle. Um, and then you can use the steel for this. Yeah. Yes. I, I might interject there. Uh, you took this from Drysdale? Yes. That one third may now be 0.45 at prime. You might check that. Okay. I, I think that that was based on the older code. Okay. Where we did use one third FM. I believe you can use 0.45 now. So okay. I'll check on that and I'll, I'll write it in your notes too. Okay. And then you also can use the steel um, to add to your compression strength using your A minus 1 times your seal gets you a little more compression strength. Um, and then for finding P allowable, you've definitely seen this equation before, but this is what we've been using. You've got your buckling factor there at the end. Um, very familiar with this, but that's just what you would use for this case. Next we're going to move into, now that part of the masonry has some tensile stress in it, which you don't get to use any tensile strength for your masonry, but it just shows that part of it has cracked, and we're now not using the whole section in compression. <coughs> so basically, from here on out, it's defined into three categories of case two, depending on where your neutral axis is, um, which is defined as X. You'll see up there. So basically, these next three categories are just going to move go, X along. Ooh. So these, these next three categories are just going to move X along the cross section, and that will be case two. But X is a very important term for this part of the derivation. So uh, this is a this is a typo here. This should be category one. Um, I noticed that this morning. But this is when X is less than D prime. What that means is this point of cracking has not yet reached the tensile of steel. So your both of your regions of steel are still within the compressive region. Um, you can calculate x here using your eccentricity and your thickness. And this also, once again, gives you a maximum axial. Although, if you say that, that one third f prime m is wrong, is this one possibly going to change? Yeah, what that is, is that, that is your maximum masonry stress. So all it does is 
that left right hand side where you have F prime M over three, mm -hmm. that's your maximum allowable measure stress. That just increases to 0.45. So I think that's true. But just go ahead assuming it's one third. Okay. Okay. It does not change the theory whatsoever. So that's really all you need to know from this portion of category. This is, should be category one. Over here, now we're going into category two, which means our first row of steel has actually gone into tension now. Um, so X is now greater than D prime. However, we're assuming that the steel has not yet yielded. So that means the compression still controls the design, but we are getting some tensile strength from our steel here. Hasn't reached yet, S, not yielded. Has it reached the allowable stress at this? Yes. Do I need to change my notation? No, no, you said it right. Okay, yeah. Your okay. words were wrong. The, the slide is right. Okay, yeah. Less than FS, not yield. That's not yield. Yes, sorry. Yeah, it's less than FS. Yeah, he's doing allowable stress. Okay. So for this, the derivation, the equation get a little bit more gross. Um, this is just used from summation of forces over this cross section, but basically, you can find the compression in your masonry, this region here, the compression in your steel, that steel right there, and then the tension in your tension steel. You add those up, that gets you your axial load. And then you can basically expand from that and you get your moment equation. So that's how you would find your, given a certain x, that's how you would find your um, allowable axial bending. So now we're going to move over to our third category. This is our final point. Um, X is still less, X is still greater than D prime, so this region in between your steel. But now we have reached our allowable stress in our tension steel. Uh, and what that means is steel is now controlling the design. So the equations don't change a lot, but it does mean that we assume our allowable stress for our tensile strength down here. So you notice these are very similar, but they're not quite the same as the last one. So that's why it's important to know if they're in category two or three, what's controlling your design, your masonry, or your steel stress. And then you also have the moment value. So I'm not expecting all of you to just pick this up now, but this is a good Can you back up one just for a second? Yeah. One more. So the big difference here is that you do have to calculate the masonry stress. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, on all the other times we've just assumed whatever you're using as your max, like what you use for these equations back here. But now you get to assume your max for your steel and you're calculating your base for stress. So once again, these two equations for your max axial and your maximum bending. And from there, you draw this up into this diagram. Um, as you can see, we can't use this whole region here. Um, so that's not actually allowed to be designed in this case one and in this three categories of case two. And so if you're, if you're drawing this for a column, you can go through all four of these cases, calculate your values, draw this up. I'm going to run through an example before I finish. This is from the textbook. Once again, I'm just going to walk step by step, sort of explain what they do, because sometimes they don't always explain the most clearly. But basically, we're going to take this masonry column, and we're just going to analyze if it's, if it's OK for the, uh, for the loads that are put on it. Do I have? Yeah, we have. 100,000 pounds, 100 kits on this, and we're using an eccentricity of 8 inches. And we're just going to see if this column can support those loads. So this is tying back to the stuff I've explained on the previous slides. We're going to check a few things just in general for masonry columns. You check that there's four bars. You check um, that the amount of steel meets our minimum, which it does. And then I also check our buckling factor, factor down here, 31.5, which I think we're going to use later. Just a few checks. Now, for this, they assumed that this masonry column was within case two, category two. And just to remind you what that means is our point of X is in between our steel regions, and we haven't yet reached the max allowable for our tension steel. So they start by calculating what the allowable stress would be for that. You recognize this equation, the buckling factor, plug in the numbers. That gets the max for that region to be 378 kips. So we're good for our axial stress. And then we have to find x to find what our moment would be on that. So this horrible derivation, um, 
you can check these numbers if you want. But basically, all this slide does is just solves for x. It's a quadratic. Yeah. So it solves for x using what we already know. And then from there, we're checking the steel stress to see if we're really in category two or three. And we see from this that we haven't reached our max stress. So it is compression control, our masonry at, is at its max stress. So from there, we go and we solve for our allowable moment. This is a lot more horrible calculations. We get that our allowable moment is um, that right there, which is greater than p times 8 inches, which is what we put our eccentricity as, which means that it's adequate for our axial and ending. So, any questions? I know that was kind of boring, but hopefully if you're ever doing this, you can print out these slides and run through all these steps pretty easily. Yeah. Okay.